Ibn Taymiyyah, born in 1263 and died in 1328. Back to the Quran and the Sunnah is a famous slogan which has been used by Muslim scholars and reformers throughout Islamic history to summon wayward Muslim rulers and the masses back to the original pristine Islam as promulgated by the Prophet Muhammad. The call, more often than not, worked due to the Muslim belief that the Quran is God's final communication to humankind, while the normative practices, the Sunnah of the Prophet, provides a powerful and pertinent commentary on the divine revelation. In other words, these two sources combined to provide a potent methodology for living a truly Islamic life. And it's for this reason Muslim scholars and reformers have been able to repeatedly utilize this slogan with much success throughout Islamic history. The Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, was one such extraordinary scholar and reformer whose religious ideas and thoughts have continued to exert a powerful influence on Muslim scholars and reformers up to the present day. Taqi al-Din Abu Abbas Ahmad ibn Abd al-Halim ibn Taymiyyah was born in Haran, a city located on the outskirts of Damascus, into a distinguished family of writers, scholars and theologians. His father, Abd al-Halim, and grandfather, Majd al-Din, were acclaimed Hanbali Fuqaha, jurists, who had authored numerous books on Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh, and hadith, the prophetic traditions. Brought up in an intellectually friendly environment, Ibn Taymiyyah memorized the entire Quran and received training in Arabic language, grammar, hadith, and aspects of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, under the guidance of his learned father. When he was barely seven, his entire family was forced to flee from Haran in the face of an imminent threat of a Mongol onslaught on the city. The Mongol horde stormed out of Asia like a thunderbolt from the heavens and inflicted a crushing blow on the Muslim world by invading Baghdad, the seat of the Muslim world at the time, and destroying everything before them with unspeakable brutality. At the time, the entire Muslim world was gripped with fear and trepidation. Although the Mongol invasion of Baghdad represented one of the most destructive periods in Islamic history, it was the valiant Egyptian Mamluk soldiers who finally stopped them in 1260 at the Battle of Ain Jalut, or the Spring of Goliath. The Mamluk victory at Ain Jalut saved Egypt, Arabia, and the neighbouring Islamic lands from Mongol invasion and pillage. Despite suffering a crushing defeat at Dain Jalut, the Mongols remained a serious threat, not prepared to take the risks. Ibn Taymiyyah's family moved to the safety of Damascus, which was then controlled by the victorious Mamluk. In Damascus, Ibn Taymiyyah's family received a warm welcome from the locals as well as the city's governors. On account of his scholarly and literary accomplishments, his father was appointed principal of the local Islamic seminary, the Darulum where he delivered regular lectures on traditional Islamic sciences. When his name and fame began to spread across Damascus, he was invited to deliver regular sermons, khutbah, at the city's historic Umayyad Mosque. Unlike his father and grandfather, young Ibn Taymiyyah was an exceptionally bright student who was blessed with a sharp intellect and retentive memory. Not surprisingly, he committed vast quantities of information which included the whole Qur'an, large collections of hadiths, juristic rulings, fatawa, poetry, books on philosophy and logic, to memory with ease. His remarkable retentive powers aside, Ibn Taymiyyah was a wide-ranging reader who studied books on Qur'anic exegesis, tafsir, theology, kalam, Islamic jurisprudence and philosophy quicker than the average person could eat their dinner. His thirst for knowledge was such that he claimed to have studied under no fewer than 200 eminent Islamic scholars of his day. And these included Sheikh Ahmad ibn Abu al-Khair, Yahya ibn al-Sarafi, and Shams al-Din al-Maqdisi, who was the chief justice of Damascus at the time. Along with his father, Abd al-Halim, and his uncle, Fakhr al-Din, these were some of the most reputed scholars of tafsir, hadith, and fiqh in Damascus at the time. He sat at their feet of these luminaries and thoroughly mastered traditional Islamic sciences, so much so that Shams al-Din, the Chief Justice, considered Ibn Taymiyyah to be competent enough to issue juristic rulings, fatawa, when he was barely 17 years old. Though Ibn Taymiyyah's formal education was that of a Hanbali theologian and jurist, he was very fond of the Qur'an from the outset. He spent hours on end studying and meditating 
on the meaning of the Quranic chapters, the surah, and its verses, ayat. He even claimed to have read more than 200 different commentaries, the fasir, of the Quran in order to familiarize himself with the diversity of views on Quranic thought and scholarship. Indeed, Ibn Taymiyyah's reading was nothing short of astonishing on its breadth and scope covering as it did all aspects of theology, Sufi thought, Islamic history, heresiographical literature, comparative religion, and Greek philosophy and logic as interpreted and championed by Muslim philosophers like Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. After conducting extensive research in almost all the branches of his learning prevalent during his time, he became recognised as a versatile Islamic scholar and thinker. Following the death of his father, he was appointed Professor of Islamic Thought at the same institution where his father taught once. He was only 20 at the time. According to the historian Shams al-Din al-Dahabi, Ibn Taymiyyah ate very little. He had no more than a few clothes and was totally devoid of sexual passion. Thus he remained a confirmed bachelor all his life. While still in his 20s, Ibn Taymiyyah's fame began to spread far and wide. Then in 1292, he went to Mecca to perform the sacred Hajj, the pilgrimage. After completing the Hajj, he returned to Damascus where he began to lecture at the city's famed Umayyad Mosque. Being an inspirational and thought-provoking speaker, his lectures attracted people from all around. His ability to recall Quranic verses and prophetic traditions with ease made him very popular with the people of Damascus, who used to flock to the mosque in their thousands to hear him speak. For his growing fame and popularity made certain elements of the local theological and political elite very angry and very jealous. Since Ibn Taymiyyah was very outspoken, these people hated him and they wanted him thrown out of Damascus. And in 1298, when he was 35, the first of a series of unfortunate incidents took place which became a source of misery and hardship for Ibn Taymiyyah. Not keen on only preaching, he went out of his way to issue legal edicts, fatawa, on several controversial theological issues, and this infuriated the established scholars of Damascus, who called on the local authorities to punish him for alleged heresy. Eager to quell the uproar, the authorities complied with the scholars' demands and imprisoned Ibn Taymiyyah. And as a skeptic scholar, Ibn Taymiyyah defied intellectual categorization. Although he was brought up and educated as a Hanbali theologian and jurist, he pushed the boundaries of established theological and legal thought to their very limits. Theologically speaking, neither Asharism or Mutazilism appealed to him. On the contrary, he vehemently refuted both theologies, preferring to interpret Islamic beliefs and concepts in accordance with the methodologies of the pious predecessors, Salaf al-Saleh based as it was on a literalist understanding of the Qur'an, the Hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet's companions, the Sahaba, and their successors, the Tabi'un. Despite being a humbly jurist, he refused to adhere exclusively to any one of the four prominent schools of Islamic legal thought, Madahib, thus leaving himself wide open to accusations of heresy and religious innovation, Bida. Instead of imitating Taqlid, one of the existing Madahib, he used his own intellectual discretion, ishtihad, and in doing so, he attempted to develop a fresh understanding of the Islamic scriptural sources, especially if he felt the views of the existing schools contradicted the original Islamic sources. But unlike what some of his so-called followers say today, Ibn Taymiyyah did not reject the existing madahib per se. As a mujtahid, one who was competent enough to exercise ishtihad, he felt he was not duty-bound to follow any one of the existing schools of law, and that is why he developed his own interpretation and understanding of Islamic theology and jurisprudence. Not surprisingly, his attempts to analyse and interpret the Qur'an, the prophetic traditions, and the views of the early Muslims in light of his own existential condition met with stiff opposition from the established ulama, the religious scholars of Damascus. Being uncompromising, and at times very stubborn, Ibn Taymiyyah rarely backed down in a confrontation with his opponents. On one occasion, where he was asked to explain the divine names and attributes, the Asma wal Sifat, in the light of the Quran and the prophetic traditions, he provided a detailed answer to the question, 
but his detractors accused him of anthropomorphism. During this period, he engaged in regular polemical debates with his opponents until in 1300, the Mongols' hordes unexpectedly breached the heavily fortified defences erected by the Mamluk and occupied Syria. In response, Ibn Taymiyyah urged the people of Damascus to defend their city and liberate their country from Mongol occupation. This declaration inspired the Syrian people that they took up arms and repelled the invaders. Impressed by Ibn Taymiyyah's ability to rally the masses as well as the troops, the governor of Damascus requested that he go to Cairo and ask Sultan Nasir to assist the Syrians in their battle against the Mongols. Moved by Ibn Taymiyyah's appeal for help, Sultan Nasir agreed to support the Syrian people. And thanks to Ibn Taymiyyah, a combined Egyptian and Syrian army confronted the Mongols in 1302. And in the ensuing battle, he fought like a lion until the enemy was driven out of the Mamluk territories. While Ibn Taymiyyah was busy fighting valiantly on the battlefield, his detractors were nowhere to be seen. Some of them even fled the battlefield as soon as they saw the advancing enemy. His role in the war against the Mongols won him national recognition in Syria. Incensed by the heroic receptions granted to him by the Syrian people, Ibn Taymiyyah's enemies again began to conspire against him. Their hatred for Ibn Taymiyyah's radical theological and legal thinking, coupled with his newfound fame and popularity with the Syrian people, and the reigning sultan, who regularly consulted him on both the political and religious issues of the day, prompted them to engage in religious debate and political intrigue in order to undermine his politico-religious standing. Ibn Taymiyyah was not only an open adversary, of those who practiced taqlid in matters of law. He went of his way to expose what he considered to be the unorthodox beliefs and practices of the Sufis, especially the metaphysical thought of Ibn al-Arabi. He also attacked the philosophical and speculative discourse of al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, al-Sharistani, and even called into question aspects of al-Ghazali's theological views. In addition to this, he comprehensively repudiated Christian views about Jesus and also systematically refuted the beliefs and practices of scores of other religious groups and sects. His intellectual brilliance, coupled with his extensive study of Islamic thought, philosophy, logic and comparative religion enabled Ibn Taymiyyah to analyse and evaluate the beliefs and practices of all these groups in the light of the Quran and the prophetic traditions before he openly pronounced his verdict on them, something which earned him the wrath of the ruling elites. Since his mission in life was to purify Islamic beliefs, teachings and practices from the stranglehold of bid'ah, blamesworthy innovation and shirk, idol worship, he remained very resolute and uncompromising in his efforts to revive the prophetic norms and practices. His stance on various religious issues led to his imprisonment on more than one occasion, including once in 1306, and again in 1309, and again in 1318, and then finally in 1326. However, he endured these trials and ordeals with patience and perseverance. His spells in prison proved intellectually very productive, especially because it was during these periods that he wrote most of his books. As an undisputed master of traditional Islamic sciences and a prolific writer, according to Al-Dahabi, he authored around 100 books and treaties on Islamic sciences, comparative religion, and aspects of philosophy and logic and mysticism. According to his other biographers, Ibn Taymiyyah authored as many as 500 books, treaties, and essays on a wide range of subjects. His most famous book included Minaj al-Sunnah al-Nabawiyah, Toward Prophetic Methodology, Majmu al-Fatawa, a collection of legal edicts, al-Rad ala al-Mantikin, the refutation of logic, al-Siyasa al-Sharia, the policy of Islamic law, al-Hisba fil Islam, public duties in Islam, and Jawab al-Sahi, the authentic response. He also authored a 40-volume commentary on the Quran under the title Bahr al-Muhit, but this has not survived.
Ibn Taymiyyah died in prison at the age of 65. And when the news of his death was relayed across Damascus, the people of the city came out in great numbers to mourn his death. It is not possible to exaggerate Ibn Taymiyyah's influence and greatness. While he considered to be one of the Muslim world's greatest thinkers, ideologues and warriors, his religious ideas and thoughts have inspired generations upon generations of outstanding Islamic scholars, thinkers and reformers such as Ibn al-Qaim al jawziya Ibn al-Kathir, Shams al-Din al-Dahabi, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Shah Waliullah, Sayyid Ahmad Barelvi, Shah Ismail Shahid, Muhammad Abdu, Haji Shariatullah of Bengal, and Abu Ala Maududi, among many others.